the Bitcoin group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Davi Barker from shinybadges.com. How's it going? Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Derek J from Peace News Now. Peace be with you. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Happy Friday. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Thanks for having me. And Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Good afternoon, Bitcoins! <laughs> Issue 1. Wikipedia unsure about Bitcoin donations. This just makes so much sense. Much like the EFF, who years ago was unsure about Bitcoins, so they refused their Bitcoin donations, only to accept them two years later when they were much valuable. Should Wikipedia accept Bitcoin donations? Play devil's advocate. Is there any reason for them to refuse? Does this make any sense? Davi Barker. You want me to play devil's advocate on Bitcoin, huh? Um, I, I can't think of a good reason. Absolutely, Wikipedia should accept Bitcoin for the same reason that Wikipedia is superior to Encarta. It is an, a company that has embraced innovation in technology and crowdsourcing information. I mean, it's, it's, it's right up their alley. It is their philosophy, so there's no reason for them not to accept it. Chris, Jay. Uh, apparently, um, the more options you give people to pay... Uh, towards the charity, the less they give overall. I'm rather confused about this as well. I did a whole bunch of research uh, leading up. So far, Jimmy Wales has received, oh, I don't know what it is in dollars, sorry, but it's £6,400 worth of Bitcoin, which is 22.12 uh, Bitcoin at the current exchange rate. So they are already receiving donations, but that's going to Jimmy Wales' personal Bitcoin account that he's holding. The only reason that I can see that they're not taking it is because of the other board members on the Wikimedia Foundation, which isn't the same as Wikipedia. It's like the, the overall uh, foundation, the board that looks after it. So I did Google all of their names, all of the members, and I used different keywords like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin criticisms. I couldn't find anything. So all I can think is is that perhaps this is an administrative problem. Maybe another thing that they're worried about is that if they are seen to be taking Bitcoin and governments around the world decide to take some critical stance on it, that they could end up being tarred with the same brush because they were associated with Bitcoin, that maybe they'll have other accounts you know, shut down or be investigated in some way. It shouldn't really be a problem because I think BitPay is already offered for free to handle their Bitcoin wallet and all they would do is give them the dollars so so the Wikipedia the Wikimedia Foundation would have to have nothing to do with the Bitcoins directly so I don't see why this should be an issue. It also seems like the Silk Road's been shut down other sites have been shut down Bitcoin is much more reasonable now than it used to be. Derek J. Yeah, uh, you've all been fooled. It's a huge fake-out, and uh, they got you, because Wikipedia, it does make so much sense. They've had experiences having their sources of revenue blocked before, and that just can't happen with Bitcoin in the same way, uh, since there's no central authority saying, like, no, no more Bitcoin donations, uh, except for Wikipedia itself. So I think that they're just trying to stay under the radar, and then they're going to have this huge announcement, boom, we accept Bitcoin, and a flood of donations will ensue. Jimmy Wales already accepts it, so it's a fake out. You've been fooled. Don't worry. Christoph Atlas. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to understand why they wouldn't go the BitPay route. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't really understand that. I know that the EFS was EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, was a bit cautious with regards to Bitcoin due to the regulatory uncertainty and how it might affect them and their donors. Uh, definitely the 501c3 designation is like a, a real delicate uh, title to have in the United States. You can kind of, it's kind of, you know, once you get it, it's, it's this precious resource. If you lose it, it's a really, really huge deal. And so I think that might be part of it. Um, and I think it just kind of, it's interesting to contrast that with a charity or organization like Free Aid, where they said, screw that 501c3 stuff, we're just going to do our thing, we'll accept Bitcoin and, and not worry about the rest of it. Um, so, I, you know, it'd be interesting to see if more charities go that route in the future. Megan Lords. 
I was a bit bummed to hear the news because it seems so. Uh, it seems like it would work perfectly. I would want to donate bitcoins to uh, Wikipedia, but at the same time, to play devil's advocate, they don't have to take Bitcoin. Um, they're going to do fine with just taking dollars, and uh, I, I think that's the real why reason why I think they're a little bit cautious. They're kind of waiting to uh, see things out and see what direction the regulatory side is going to go, and they're probably a bit nervous, but uh, yeah, at this point, they don't really have to take Bitcoin to survive. Will, Pangman. Yeah, I, uh, I guess if I'm playing devil's advocate, I'm wondering, you know, since the open source nature of Wikipedia and that of Bitcoin would seem to align, um, and they have obviously plenty of demand, I'm sure, influx of emails, posts, and for years now, news stories or, you know, just clamoring, really, from most or much or a, a good segment of their community to do this, uh, why, wouldn't they, why wouldn't they do it? There are no disadvantages, as Chris pointed out. If you, you know, take a free service from a payment processor and have everything converted to the currency of your choice, no banks will um, shy away from that, you know? So... Um, if I'm playing devil's advocate and we're looking at things and we're seeing agendas or philosophies that would align, perhaps they don't align um, for, for whatever reason. What, what might those reasons be? I guess it could be as innocent as some PR concerns. You know, Silk Road was mentioned by some of the previous panelists or just uh, the instability or, you know, whatever reasons people have. But again, those reasons have all been addressed repeatedly. So... The only other thing I suspect is that there's um, some kind of entrenched interest on their board or uh, some authority figure behind the scenes who um, stands not to benefit if they were to ex accept Bitcoin. Now, I won't speculate any further than that, but that's my devil's advocate position, I guess, that perhaps we're all on the outside thinking the philosophies would align with open source and so on, but maybe there are some interests there um, that don't. Maybe the individual authors of Wikipedia could start accepting Bitcoin donations for, for actually correcting the blog posts. Maybe they should build that into their reputation system because one of the most innovative things about Wikipedia was actually what it did on the back end. It's the most interesting bit isn't the, the way it looks when you go to it. The most interesting bit is the self-governance, the anarchistic governance structure that goes on back end. So maybe you could actually build an incentive structure with uh, tipping into the reputation system. I think that's a good idea. Once you had the donation authors or addresses for the authors, you could have some kind of automatic tip bot. If you read their article, you donate them a nickel. Exactly. Just that's really wander good. through the site donating nickels to authors, and if they get a pile of nickels, it could be some good money. As, as people have get it. ramped up with change tip, as they start to learn about change tip and move from the Reddit tip bot to change tip for all the social media channels, maybe, as Chris pointed out, these... these um, Wikipedia authors, uh, you know, maybe Change Tip needs to add another little uh, vector for their business so that they can provide this um, for these Wikipedia authors and just circumvent the whole board, authority, slow bureaucracy structure altogether, which is, again, exactly what Bitcoin does. They could just as easily create a Wikipedia article describing the Wikipedia authors that take Bitcoin and what their addresses are. That would be a start, just adding I mean, it's factual idea. information, right? Yeah, just get it together is all I need. But the real reason that Wikipedia is not accepting Bitcoin, I can tell you right here, this is an exclusive. Wikipedia is developing its own coin, Wikicoin. Exit question, how long before Wikipedia changes their mind? Dolly Barker. I'm 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 gonna put my money on Derek's answer and that they have already changed their mind. I think he's right. <laughs> Chris J. I think they'll probably try something out on social media um, in the coming months. I don't think they'll put it on their main on their main page. Derek J. It could be as soon as right after this episode of the Bitcoin group. I mean, they're going to listen to the feedback from the people who use their service. They're going to be facing a, a lot of feedback in the next coming weeks. So I say the timeline for uh, Wikipedia to accept Bitcoin is in weeks, months, certainly by the end of this year. 
Days, not months. Months, not years. Christoph, Atlas. <clears throat> yeah, we certainly don't know, but you know, Chris's response gets me thinking. Uh, what would stop someone from creating a competitor to Wikipedia, simply fork Wikipedia, and include a, a tipping system in there for the authors? I can't really think, you know, if, I, if I'm someone that's uh, editing Wikipedia, why would I bother editing uh, on Wikipedia in the future if I can do the exact same thing and receive some compensation for it at the same time? It's a good idea. Megan Lords. I want to be optimistic about this and say within six months, hopefully by the end of the year, but they have to be shown that it's going to be valuable for them to take, and I think it's up to Bitcoiners to show them that and really provide that feedback to encourage them that this is something they want to do. Will Pangman. I'm very suspicious as to why they haven't done this already. There is no risk for doing, you know, for accepting Bitcoin, especially on a, on a site such as theirs with the structure of publications such as theirs. So I don't think they ever will. Um, and, you know, maybe we can circumvent that, as I said in uh, my previous answer. That's a very safe bet if we're using prices right rules. Moving on, issue two, Amazon says no to Bitcoin. Walmart says no to GIFT. A tough week for Bitcoin and retail as GIFT had to retract their Walmart gift card service and Amazon flat out said no, citing a lack of customer demand. Walmart is famously suing Visa over swipe fees and Amazon used to be a technology company. Why would they both say no to Bitcoin? Chris Ellis. Ah, oh, you came to me, and I was—I've just set up a link on Twitter between uh, Wikipedia and Change Tips. I just did that, and I linked them to the video. So I—you I, caught me off guard a little bit. So this is the Amazon story, right? So I wanted to draw everyone's attention, if I may, um, to the fact that you can actually spend money on Amazon at the moment. I'm not being paid to say this is Purse.io. Um, I know some people that have used it. It looks very good. You should also check out, and we'll tweet this out in a minute from our Twitter accounts, the Amazon page, which is the general questions contact us page. You can only get to this page if you're already logged in to Amazon. And you can register your complaint here. You may want to put it in less profaneous terms than I've chosen to just there. Let me remove that. Um, but essentially, you, you say no more. Uh, non-order questions and then you just go for other and then you just say take my Bitcoin take it now or I'm moving my business elsewhere so I don't know was the question something like why don't they take it I think probably because um, the, the whole kind of news at the moment is kind of slightly fatigued about Bitcoin nothing's really happening at the moment we're kind of in this sort of limbo period and I, I actually do think that we are perhaps getting a bit too ahead of ourselves from like from a sort of publicity perspective around Bitcoin. I think as people who are trying to advocate it, I, I'm certainly rethinking the way I talk about Bitcoin. I'm talking much more now about the protocol and the network and the idea itself because I still think there are fundamental question, question marks over whether or not uh, Bitcoin is just a brand and that as a, as a brand, whether or not that's the one that's going to succeed or whether or not the idea still needs to be implemented. Maybe Amazon have got their own plans. In fact, they do, don't they? They have a, an Amazon coin already. So I, I, would, I would say that large companies like this are probably going to want to see another year's worth of... Um, resilience in the in the market before they adopt it. Derek J. Um, <clears throat> why would they both say no to Bitcoin? You! You! You are the reason. You listening and you all on this panel, myself included, I've shopped on Amazon dozens of times and I've used Bitcoin to do it in the past two years. And how many times did I tweet them to say, please accept Bitcoin? How many times did I send them an email or fill out one of these complaints? I think it's time we take personal responsibility for these uh, the companies that aren't listening to our demands. I mean, we're still shopping at these places. Uh, let's let them hear us and not just be talking to each other, but right to them. Uh, I, I'm curious to know how many of you have actually addressed Amazon personally. So I think they're procrastinating and they're underestimating the power of the Bitcoin technology because they're simply not hearing it from enough people. It seems as though the gift middleman is coming back on us there. We all can buy things easily, so we just don't care, and we don't bother them. So it's a good point. Christoph. The statement that Amazon made doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. They said, uh, we're not hearing from customers that it's the right payment technology for them. 
but it's a payment option. It's not like Amazon, uh, you know, they appropriate Bitcoin and then everyone's locked into using it and they're like, oh, how the hell do I get my hands on Bitcoin? I can't figure this out. No, it would just be, it would be alternative to the existing payment mechanisms. Um, I think probably the main reason why they haven't adopted yet is because they don't have a vision of this cryptocurrency future. They don't have a sense of uh, what that's going to look like in the future, or maybe they don't have a sense of how quickly it's going to come. Maybe they're pessimistic about how quickly it's going to come. And if they do try to adopt Bitcoin, it's not a trivial matter. You know, they do have to change their software. They it's going to cost them money to actually build the software to you know integrate it into their company. And so if it's not going to be offset by um, you know profits in the near term, they're accountable to their shareholders and you know all those kind of people. So they may just be waiting for the right moment. And it does look like Bitcoin is in a bit of a lull right now with, with, with the price and the sentiment. And maybe they're just waiting to see a bit more spark in the Bitcoin space, more people getting in there before they jump in there themselves and make the commitment um, and the investment into applying Bitcoin. I think you make a good point, Christoph. We've been far too reasonable with them. We've been saying they should just accept Bitcoin. We should say they should stop accepting Visa and MasterCard and only accept Bitcoin. That's a better stance. Megan, Lords. So this is disappointing, but it shows the reality uh, from the perspective of the rest of the people who aren't in Bitcoin. We, uh, we sometimes live in this bubble with Bitcoin. We're very enthusiastic. We are very excited because we can see the future. We can see the potential of this technology. But not everyone shares our vision with this, and we have to bring it to them and not just to Amazon, although I think that's a great idea. I definitely agree with Derek that we need to be more proactive as Amazon customers and demand that they adopt this technology. But at the same time, they have a lot that they have to do to prepare to do that. And if they already have their own coin, maybe they're already thinking, about going in a different direction, but we need to get other people on board with it too, other people who would be shopping at Amazon and, and show them the value of this technology so that they can also demand it. Uh, I don't think they have to take Bitcoin though for a, very, for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it has to do with they're limited in their perspective in regard to the future, and they're doing just fine without it. Let's be honest. They don't really, I mean, Bitcoin users make up a very, very, very small percentage of the population. Amazon doesn't need us, really, uh, is what it comes down to. Uh, so while I was really disappointed in this, it wasn't completely surprising. I, of course, hope they change their mind on it, but it's up to us to show the value of the technology and... Um, encourage other people to do that too in regards to Amazon. Will Pangman. Yeah, I think um, what what we're seeing is, you know, I think like Megan mentioned, you know, they're comfortable, they're profitable, they're not interested in applying any additional resources. I don't think they'd have to spend a lot of additional resources. Um, Coinbase sent a developer to Overstock.com and got them implemented. I presume they'd be happy to do that free of charge with uh, Amazon as well and just reap the fees, you know, uh, from the purchases. So I don't think it's a, a, a question of resources or, or maybe even ideology. I don't think that's it either. Um, what I think we're seeing is that um, Bitcoin user adoption has far outpaced merchant adoption perhaps and, uh, that, and perhaps also outpaced the ability of Bitcoin uh, from a source code standpoint to scale. Uh, along with adoption. So we've heard for the last couple months about the core developers, you know, struggling to um, get needed fixes and patches in, in place, and, and there are some new innovations, you know, that are, are hopefully going um, hopefully going to solve that concern, you know, with Bitcoin Core and uh, maybe even side chains and stuff like that. But uh, it's it's a slow process to improve the code of Bitcoin or add features to it. Uh, as we've seen, it's not a matter so much of bureaucracy around it. It's just a, a very delicate thing. You don't want to screw up. So um, hopefully, you know, we'll just see some more merchants, large merchants, take the leap of faith. You know, like like Patrick Byrne from Overstock did. Um, a lot of them are seeing this this trend now. I mean, you only have to talk with you know honchos like Mark Andreessen once to kind of be swayed to the to the threshold of actually adopting it. 
you know, people like that can can have a lot of influence here in, in the space of merchant adoption or or other innovations like that. So I'm not worried about whether or not Amazon ever does accept Bitcoin. I'll just go to Snapcard, join Snapcard.com, and buy whatever I want on Amazon through them. Or you know, Gift.com is another one of those services. You know, um, I know the other part of this uh, topic is Walmart. Um, there's a lot of things that I need that I don't want to go to Walmart for in the first place, even if they carry the product. You can find it cheaper elsewhere, you know, contrary to popular belief in, in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, it's nice to walk into a store like Walmart and show your phone with the gift card on it and just check out like that. I, I like doing that at Gap. I, I saw Derek's video or um, commentary on that last year. That was lots of fun. That spurred me to do the same at CVS, you know, as right before the closure of Silk Road, people were decrying Bitcoin as, you know, you can only buy legal, uh, illegal drugs with it. Well, I buy legal drugs with it. You know, I go to CVS Pharmacy and I buy my prescriptions there sometimes. So, and I would tell people that, and that would get people thinking. Uh, there's too many tools that we can use as advocates to sway people, merchants and consumers, but there is kind of a bottleneck at, at merchant adoption um, that we really need to overcome if, uh, and, and it might be a failure of education, to be honest. It might be, this is one of my biggest uh, focuses, biggest concerns. Uh, I put a lot of energy behind these things. If we aren't um, able to get merchants on board without, you know, with, with the, the nature of accepting Bitcoin being essentially risk-free for them, uh, we're doing something wrong with education. So we got to clean up our message or get better at uh, delivering the message. Davi Barker. Um, when firms get big, they get cautious. Uh, you know, it's it's much more difficult to change the direction of a buffalo than a field mouse. And uh, we've sort of all, like in the Bitcoin space, hovered around Amazon, and I think that's because we really want that headline that Amazon accepts Bitcoin because Amazon is kind of the buffalo on the internet. But Amazon's statement, and to some extent, like the comments I'm hearing from the rest of the group here, make me actually think that it's not even just about Bitcoin. It's also that Amazon is losing its competitive edge. And that is something that also happens with large firms. I think that this quote belongs to Steve Jobs, uh, and I'm paraphrasing either way, so I'm not sure. But I believe that he said something like, I don't try and sell people what they say they want. I try to sell people what they don't even know they want yet. Right? And if you look at Amazon's statement and you listen to the comments that are being made here, we're all saying customers are telling Amazon what they want. And Amazon is saying the customers are not telling us that they want this. Well, that means that Amazon has lost its competitive edge. And so I think maybe it's because um, Amazon is large, Amazon is cautious, and Amazon is going to be compliant. And the further we go into this space, the further intervention that we get in the Bitcoin space from the government, the harder it's going to be for the buffaloes in the room to comply and adopt Bitcoin. So part of the transformative edge that Bitcoin is going to have is that it's going to make it easier for small firms to adopt and harder for large firms to adopt. And we're going to see a reversal of the kind of state crony capitalism pressures that create large firms and punish small firms. So I actually am kind of thinking maybe Bitcoin isn't for Amazon, at least not as they're currently constructed. Exit question. How long before Amazon changes their mind? Chris, J. Well, we've got um, 0 0.9 out now of Bitcoin clients. So that means that you can actually issue refund addresses uh, with your transactions. So there's no excuse. Um, but I think it will be some time, not least because I think they've got their own agenda. I think that um, they're pretty uh, megalomaniac around there, so they're probably going to want their own coin. So I wouldn't expect any time soon. Derek J. One year. That's forever in Internet years. And if the techies at Amazon aren't screaming into the years of management by that point, Amazon might have bigger problems behind the scenes. Christoph Atlas. Um, I was just thinking, if it's a matter of them having their competing coin, which is not going to be a cryptocurrency, but some other kind of digital currency, uh, probably pegged to the dollar, uh, maybe that would be a good application for a side chain to the to, to Bitcoin. So that way, they are not necessarily intertwining themselves with the value of Bitcoin or Bitcoin as a currency, but Bitcoin as a payment network and uh, they're still able to, able to have their own coin, that could be a nice marriage of the two technologies. 
Megan Lords. So I'm a bit pessimistic with this. They don't have to, and as long as they don't have to, they won't. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't really see them changing their mind on this. I really hope they would, but they don't have to. They they're very comfortable in the position they're in right now. Like Davi said, they're very comfortable with the way things have been for a while now, and they don't really have a whole lot of incentives to expand a Bitcoin. Again, we make up a very very small percentage of the entire. Uh, population that uses Bitcoin or that uses Amazon and yeah I, I don't really see them changing their mind on this. Will Pengman. Never. <laughs> Davi Barker. Uh, I want to be clear I, I do think that they are going to be changing their mind but I think that they're going to be kicking and screaming when they do it and what it's going to come down to is they're going to realize that all of these third-party processors that allow us to use Bitcoin on Amazon anyway are bleeding their profits. And there is a point where that's going to be too much for them to sustain. Like, to use my original metaphor, the field mice are chewing on the buffalo. So I do believe that they're going to change, but I just think that they're, they're too slow moving. So I'm going to say a long prognosis and say two years. Issue three, mainstream media wakes up to the Sabo linguistic evidence story. The Who is Satoshi Nakamoto story is back again. The media will never give this one up. This time they've got Nick Scabo, who at the very least participated in the white paper. But does that make him Satoshi Nakamoto? Does the media have their man? Derek J. Yeah, it doesn't matter if uh, Sabo is the guy or not. I mean, even if the media does have their man, they're never going to stop looking. So the purpose, in my opinion, of the mainstream media is to propagandize for the authorities. And so they focus on authorities and figureheads, but that is irrelevant to Bitcoin. They don't get that yet. They soon will. It seems they almost can't understand Bitcoin unless they know who's behind it. Uh, the actual thing doesn't matter. It's just the leader of the thing. Christoph, Atlas. I think there's a number of reasons why people just can't leave Satoshi alone. Um, it's kind of a, a John Galt story, which is very compelling. You've got this brilliant mind that single-handedly invents a new technology that revolutionizes the world, and he's got this kind of shadow, shadowy identity. I think also some people are uncomfortable with Bitcoin, and so they want to kind of chalk it up to the invention of a particular man rather than looking at it as a evolution in a series of technologies, a movement towards uh, cryptocurrencies um, from a, you know, a, a legacy banking system away from fiat currencies, um, distributing power um, to a broader group of people. Um, that's a very uncomfortable truth for many and a difficult one to swallow. And so if you just point it at one particular nerd and say, hey, it's just this nerd's idea and somehow it took off, um, I think that's a way of trying to disarm Bitcoin, but in the long run, it's not going to work. Excellent points. Megan Lords. So to Bitcoiners, this isn't very significant because a lot of us already believe that we're all Satoshi. That's kind of the point. Uh, that's the whole point of Bitcoin. It's, it's this awesome, amazing decentralized technology. But to your average person, it's a scary thing, this idea of this anonymous creator. So whether or not Sabo is the creator of Bitcoin, it doesn't matter to Bitcoiners, but it's very important for answering the concerns of the rest of the world who's very uncertain where this technology came from. And that's what I found to be a hindrance to a lot of people that I've talked to about Bitcoin is that it was created, that no one knows who created it. And yes, I've tried to explain to them, well, you know, we're all participating in this, all that. But what it comes down to is your average person is still locked in this mentality that there needs to be an authority figure. And as long as they're locked in that mentality, it's a very hard thing to overcome. It takes a very long time to overcome. And I think in a way it could be a good thing if somehow Sabo is found to be the creator of Bitcoin because it would ease the concerns of a lot of people who have that fear of it. Um, again, it, it, it's, it means different things to different people though. So you have your Bitcoiners who, it's not a huge deal. Like I, I don't care who came up with Bitcoin. I, I'm not that concerned with it. But other people outside the bubble very much do and it's going to hinder them from jumping on board in a lot of cases. But I do think a lot of this is just the media searching for a story and that's what they're going to continue to do. They're not, uh, I, don't, I don't know that 
so many of them are looking for the truth about who's behind Bitcoin, but they're more looking for a story and that they can, you know, raise suspicions about or they can kind of add to the allure of Bitcoin. So, yeah, it, it could be good or bad. Uh, it's insignificant to Bitcoiners, but it could be pretty significant to people who were afraid of getting into Bitcoin because they don't know who created it. Will Pangman. So I have it on good authority that um, the people who currently work with Nick Szabo on uh, the current projects, they jokingly refer to him as Satoshi and things like that, and whoop de doo you know, I mean, the guy is a brilliant man, you know. Um, perhaps there's some truth here. He, like, as you said, Tom, at the very least, he had some per maybe involvement with the drafting of the paper. Um, good. Um, it doesn't matter who he is. I, you know, Chris did a great um, episode with Andreas on the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, and they touched on this briefly about getting over, you know, as, as Megan is pointing out, helping <laughs> the people inquiring on about Bitcoin get over the fact that they need to know who created it because it truly doesn't matter. Bitcoin is self-governing. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, the code is self-governing. Um, self-regulating and so on, and, and I'm interested to hear Chris's take on this answer, um, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but these, these people asking about uh, who the creator may be, whether it's the media or just, you know, anyone who might be curious but really needs more to be able to trust the thing more, uh, if they need trust, they need to either learn how to read code or read the white paper some more. Davi Barker. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said that all great things must first wear terrifying and monstrous masks. And if people are afraid of Satoshi Nakamoto's anonymity or they're afraid that Bitcoin will be used for various nefarious activities online, I think that is just a terrifying and monstrous mask that this great thing is wearing. And I really hope we never discover who he is. I hope 30 years from now, Bitcoin is the dominant currency in the world or some version of it, and this person is celebrated as a liberator of mankind, and nobody knows who he is. Because if we do ever find out who he is, we're going to have statues of him, and we're going to have monuments to him, and we're going to have, like, fake cherry tree, I never tell a lie kind of stories about all the similar to other quote-unquote great men in history. And I would prefer that he was ever an international internet man of mystery. Well said, Davi. Chris, J. Yeah, so actually there's a really good follow-up article in Business Insider that I found where it said basically there's a gaping flaw in the new Satoshi study. And it's not, it, it was pretty obvious from the start, but they found this uh, expert, Jeremy Clark, who's an assistant professor at information systems engineering at uh, Concordia University uh, in Montreal. And he said some things that I just felt were uh, quite sort of, revealing really. If you if you take 13 people, someone will almost always be the closest to your definition. Essentially the sample size was really, really small, the people that they were using and they were comparing the text to. Um, and also you don't see anything that, that a lot of the, the, the phraseology that they were uh, picking out um, was nothing you wouldn't see in nearly any crypto paper. There's also nothing to indicate that Nick can even write code and he has been saying for quite some time that his Bitcoin, his bit gold proposal which is uh, something of a, a precursor to Bitcoin, he still believes that it's better than Bitcoin so all of this evidence is circumstantial. I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this has been a slow news week this week and there hasn't been a lot of drama, another big government hasn't banned Bitcoin again and I think this should um, point us in the direction with all this stylometry, the fact is that all, all this technology in the world, if you have a very small sample size, you're not, you're not going to arrive at the right uh, conclusion. The thing is, if you, if you spend less time as a consumer of content um, actually just scouring the, the web for mere appearances of things and you're just getting obsessed over what people look like and who, you know, who invented what, then the media will just keep pandering to you and just keep giving you what, what you want. Um, yeah, so I think this is a massive distraction. I actually really liked one comment from Reddit that I'd like to read out from a uh, from a user called Can't Get You a Toe. He said, Newsweek looked into it. They concluded Nick Szabo can't possibly be Satoshi. His name is not Satoshi. Case closed. <laughs> Very good. Exit question. Is Nick Szabo Satoshi Nakamoto? Yes or no? Derek J. No. Christoph Atlas. 
No. Megan Lords. No, and it doesn't matter. Will Penguin. No. Davi Barker. Uh, yes, in the I am John Galt sense of the word. Chris J. No, and I don't care. Looks like a series of no's for Scabo. Looks like I shouldn't ask him for a loan after all. Issue four, Dogecoin. Gas station should accept Bitcoin. And Ron Paul doesn't think Bitcoin is real money. What's more exciting for Bitcoin? The Dogecon? The world's first altcoin convention going off next Friday, April 25th in San Francisco. Or that gas station should be accepting Bitcoin, especially given the excellent development of the Bitcoin accepting gas pump by hero engineer Andy Schroeder. Or Ron Paul, the old gold bug who doesn't get it. The revolution that he always dreamed of is right at hand, and he can't understand it because he's too old to email. Ron Paul, the Dogecon, or gas station should accept Bitcoin. Which is a mo more exciting development for Bitcoin? Christoph Atlas. Uh, what's most compelling to me is the Ron Paul story, and I'll, let me explain that. So Ron Paul is this politician in the United States, uh, former politician, he's retired now, and for some reason people are still paying attention to him. And um, he was you know, supposed to be the sort of the savior of the libertarian movement, as a political movement in the last several decades and I don't think he actually achieved any of that. Um, so what's exciting about this to me is that Ron Paul is a symbol of the old guard of the libertarians. Libertarians being you know, people that want to reduce government's impact on people's, uh, people's personal liberty. And so we're seeing this movement away from uh, trying to change the system within to trying to take down the system from outside of it. And this has been a very frustrating area for libertarians for a number of years. Uh, they tried it with politics, they tried uh, getting jobs in educational institutions that are, you know, ultimately being, you know, their paychecks are sort of being paid by uh, the government in some sense as professors of these institutions or um, they actually aren't forced to compete in a market because they have a tenure as professors. Uh, we've had entrepreneurs that have tried to create giant companies and they generally find that they get to a certain size and then they have to um, kind of morph into a state institution in order to continue their growth. So this has been a really you know, frustrating area for libertarians for a number of years and I think that they're starting to figure it out. They're, the next movement of libertarians are crypto libertarians and it's all about attacking the state from outside rather than trying to state it, change it from within. And so Ron, Ron Paul is the old guard and uh, Satoshi is the new guard. Megan Lord. If you're still concerned about what Ron Paul has to say about Bitcoin in the age of the internet, you're doing it wrong. Uh, there's no reason why anything Ron Paul says about Bitcoin should be really considered weighty. I mean, uh, like you said, he, he's not very social media savvy. I don't know how savvy he is in regard to you know the other functions of the internet, but I don't view that as big. What's big is are gas stations going to take Bitcoin? So that's really exciting to me because that opens Bitcoin up to a huge variety of people. Everyone has to go to a gas station, just about. I mean, unless you know, <laughs> unless you have like a totally electric car and you're able to somehow, I don't know, avoid the things at gas stations. But everyone needs to use gas stations. So if you can get gas stations to take Bitcoin, that's going to make more people look at it as something like, oh, well, this seems you know pretty normal, something that I can get into, something kind of safe. So I think that's the main story. Uh, I was excited to hear about uh, the Dogecoin conference uh, or the altcoin conference. I think that's really exciting for people who are into cryptocurrencies. I, I would like to see more of that because I, I'm kind of fascinated with altcoins. I want to learn more about them. I think that's really exciting. But I think the biggest story is uh, Bitcoin hope, or gas stations hopefully opening up to Bitcoin. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with the previous two panelists about the Ron Paul thing. I mean, countless people have come to the ideas of liberty, for lack of a better term, through Ron Paul's previous two ventures uh, toward the presidency. Um, you know, 
There was tons of mainstream media attention on the ideas he was bringing forth, and millions of people converted to a lot of these ideas. So um, certainly he has an influence uh, in that, and I think a lot of those people were young people, and a lot of those young people are now perhaps self-described crypto-libertarians, crypto-anarchists, anarcho-capitalists, the types of people who have really uh, allowed Bitcoin to mature as much as it has so far and supported that, um, you know, supported the growth of the community in, in, to a large extent. So his influence is important. You know, I think, uh, you know, I disagree with Ron Paul on quite a bit of things as a politician, much like I disagree with, let's say, Alex Jones on pretty much, you know, all of his alarmism. But the fact of the matter is, for the last 15 years or so, uh, he, both of these men have show, shown light on issues that are real and actual, um, you know, not everything, but a lot of it uh, that, that's needed the light of day and, and needed people to take a closer look at it and also spurn critical thinking and allow people to find virtue in determining things for themselves and using critical thinking in that regard. So, um, so I'd like to make that point. The biggest story for me is the Dogecoin. Uh, it's it's huge. Dogecoin brings more people to Bitcoin, perhaps, than anything else currently. And that's awesome because uh, people are gravitating to this meme, they gravitate to an online currency, and they don't even know what cryptocurrency means initially. The tipping culture is fantastic in that community. They have done so many things right from a marketing and PR standpoint, uh, charitable giving standpoint. They're, they're still kicking ass. and. I hope they keep doing it. I want to see the NASCAR. I want to see more, um, you know, more charitable uh, organizations jumping on board with Dogecoin, more merchant processors allowing it, CoinKite, um, and so on. I mean, that stuff's exciting. GoCoin, that is what's going to bring people to this thing and see its viability, um, you know, because all of a sudden they have this magic internet money, and then they take a look at Bitcoin and they see that its fundamentals are far, far more sound than the playful Dogecoin. So uh, I'm, I'm big on Dogecoin, um, and, you know, think about it. We've got, uh, we've got many vectors through which people adopt Bitcoin, and a lot of them are very small subsets of society that have large voices or loud voices, like Forex traders, like uh, venture capitalist communities, startups, um, you know, and libertarianism. These are small sections of society with large mouthpieces or, or, or large... Um, megaphones, <laughs> uh, speaking of Alex Jones, but, um, you know, the, those people, th those groups draw a lot to Bitcoin, and it's time that we allowed Bitcoin to have more of a coming out party, more inclusive. Um, Bitcoin's for everyone. I don't want to see this stay with, quote-unquote, libertarians or just in the fintech sectors or just in VC, you know, um, VC, uh, the VC space and so on. It's, it's very important that uh, we get young people onboarded, and this is done through Dogecoin. And gas, gas especially, but I, you know, hopefully before long, you know, like, man, before five years from now, hopefully we can get off of petrol altogether. I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty dirty form of energy, and I, uh, I think we've had for dozens of years better forms of energy, um, more plentiful even, and so on and so on. So, yeah, the gas thing will help people find a real-world application for Bitcoin where they previously did not and maybe consider it. But, um, you know, Dogecoin, man. Dogecoin, FTW. Davi Barker. So I don't subscribe to the great man theory of history. I actually I don't think that Ron Paul revitalized the liberty movement. I feel like the liberty movement was there and ready and fertile, and then someone appeared, and it was there ready for him. And... Um, I think that desiring the endorsement of Ron Paul is sort of like desiring the endorsement of Amazon.com. Uh, but that being said, uh, Ron Paul is, to a large extent, responsible for why I had the knowledge and the background on economics to know what Bitcoin was when I saw it. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for the man, even if he's old and he's fallen behind and he doesn't see the sort of consequences of his own philosophy, that's okay. But the thing is is that he acknowledges that and if you go back and you listen to his early speeches, he was always one to say this movement is not about me, this movement is about all of you. And now that he's out of politics and now that it is clearly not about him because he doesn't have the podium anymore, this is what all of us have done. 
And even if he doesn't sort of see the economics of it, I think that, and in fact I've heard him say, that he does understand that a voluntary currency in and of itself is better no matter what. And so I don't want to get into the sort of name-calling of Ron Paul or mocking him as an old man or whatever. I feel like he's the grandpa who has retired, and it's time to, you know, go to his house occasionally and have tea and listen to him speak and then go about the rest of your lives. Like, he deserves to be respected, He, but he deserves to, you know, be read a story and put to bed. Chris, J. Yeah, I was actually going with the Ron Paul story as well. Um, he didn't actually say, well, he said that he was a big fan of it. He said that he, he liked the idea and that he felt that there should be competition in, in currency. So I didn't read it as being like a negative story. And obviously, I'm not American. I don't, I don't necessarily get the whole kind of history behind it. Um, but I, I, did, I thought that that headline was a little bit misleading myself. I'm also excited about the Dogecoin um, conference, not least because I'd love to go. So if you want to sponsor me to go, I can like hang out in my black turtleneck, uh, do my whole kind of Steve Jobs impression with a roaming mic, and I think me and Tom, we're just going to go around there and party it up. So perhaps we should get a get a tipping address, Tom. What do you think? We'll just get that. Dogecoin address out on Twitter for Chris Ellis. Same. Well, not too, well. How about we just get the whole WCN crew down there? We'll get one of those vans with satellite dishes on the. How do we get one of those? <laughs> Can somebody make that happen? How many people are watching this right now, Tom? There are 24 viewers watching. 20, this. Mate, 24. There must be someone who knows how to get one of those Scooby Doo vans, right? <laughs> that's got like the satellites and everything, so we can do the link ups. I That'd know it was just last week. Davi was requesting a Ninja Turtles van, so there is a lot of van requests going on. Yeah, so I do. I do like it. Um, I I am a little bit. Um, I don't like the whole kind of PR stuff that I I see coming out of Dogecoin. If you go onto the Reddit and you're in any way critical of Doge, they kind of like jump on you. And so I, what I don't like, I'm kind of um, ambivalent. On the one hand, I really like what Dogecoin are doing for the crypto community as a whole because it's you know every industry has a a, fu a fluffy, cuddly brand, and it does make it um, amenable to to new people that would be otherwise skeptical. But I also don't like this kind of picking a team like a football team, and then you've got your team and you've got your team, and then you kind of create this kind of tribalism and this conflict between the communities. I'm not a big fan of that at all. I'm also quite skeptical because it looks like Doge have a lot of money, at less in backing. They're clearly able to afford the PR campaigns, they're able to pay for this kind of level of sponsorship, which makes me question the sustainability and the long-term survivability of it. I don't like the way that they put, like, you know, it's going to go to the moon and all this kind of stuff, because that implies that you're only buying it because you want the price to go up, but then at the same time, Jackson will say on the Reddit bots and a lot of the community uh, managers will say, yeah, but you're not supposed to do it so that the price goes up. You're supposed to use this for tipping. In fact, he mandates this in a lot of the competitions. If he says, like, if, if I give you this Dogecoin, you've got to promise that you're going to use it to tip people. And that, I feel, goes way, way against the libertarian kind of ideas that I felt I that I enjoyed hearing so much, not as a libertarian myself, but I enjoy do hearing from, from you guys, because I don't think you should be questioning what someone else is going to do with their money. So with that caveat in place, on balance, I think the net effect of Dogecoin is a positive one, and I'd love to go and like hang out and, and do like a, a roaming news at the Dogecon. We're going to give it a try next week, next Friday, Dogecon. Exit question. Just repeat after me. Gas stations should accept Bitcoin. Gas stations should accept Bitcoin? There we go. Wait a minute, I didn't get to give my answer. For <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead, Tex. The, the most exciting development is Dogecoin. It represents the progression of the, the blockchain technology. But I was surprised to hear Ron Paul diss Bitcoin. Uh, I would think that he would see the similarities that Bitcoin shares with his, his favorite uh, values of the Austrian economists. So do I want him to cheer on Bitcoin? Yes, absolutely. But I don't want my friends to adopt Bitcoin because Ron Paul said so. I want them to look into it for themselves and see that it can benefit them today and give them more freedom. So there already are gas stations. I don't know why this isn't more well known, but there are gas stations that already accept Bitcoin. For example, Crossroads Gas Station in Texas is called in my call-in show. And there's also a free state-owned gas station in New Hampshire that accepts it. And there are others. Uh, there's but a now, gas station in Durango, Colorado. Right, but now Doge, Dogecon. 
I hear about a new crypto conference every day. Uh, young people are learning how to use and mine cryptocurrencies, and it's encouraging them to learn about money, freedom, and coding. And this bodes well for the free future that I want to see. So I don't celebrate the gap that it sort of creates between those who embrace innovation and those who want to shy away from it. But that divide is going to become painful. And uh, eventually the caboose is going to catch up with the innovators. They always do. But uh, like Netflix was around like 10 years ago, but it, it failed to rise into its own until the last couple of years. I see Dogecoin as a way to, or Dogecon is a way to help spread adoption for all of these cryptocurrencies. So don't wait for the caboose to catch up or the slow pokes to move on to the next thing. Keep moving along, keep innovating, keep connecting with others in the cryptocurrency space. It's working. It's a good point, Derek. We don't know who's going to be at Dogecoin. It's certainly not going to be the venture capitalists at the $300 a ticket Bitcoin conventions that we've been seeing lately. I'm told the event is free. It sounds like pizza and beer or at least pizza and soda may be provided. I don't know if the audience of Dogecon can even drink beer. We'll find out. I was going to have you guys repeat gas stations should accept Bitcoin as the exit question because of this old story called Carthago Delenda Est, which you guys don't know. So a long time ago there was this senator, and after every one of his speeches in Rome, he would repeat Carthago Delenda Est, Carthago Delenda Est, over and over and over these words again. Carthago must die. Carthago must be destroyed. And no one was really into it for a long time, but he kept repeating it, and he kept repeating it, and he made it like a, almost a greeting, almost a generic thing that he would just say over and over and over again until eventually the Romans gave in. They sent the fleet over to Carthage. They killed everyone in the city. They burned the city to the ground. They razed the structures. They filled in the port, and then they salted the soil so that nothing would ever grow there again. And that's why I think we should say Carthago Delenda S, gas stations should accept Bitcoin. I just like saying it. And uh, C.S. Lewis said, if you say something three times, it must be true. So I, like, I just like saying it. You guys aren't into it, so I'm not going to make you say it. But we're going to move on to questions and answers. There aren't a lot of questions, but there is a good one. And I think it's science fiction and well worth answering. How do you feel about, in the near future, your own physical body using your own unique DNA as a hard wallet via touch or breath, etc., for Bitcoin trade. Davi Barker, would you like to be part of the Bitcoin equation? I don't think I understand the question. Yes, I, uh, I agree. Chris agrees. So, um, like, instead of a private... DNA. DNA is the blockchain. DNA is the original blockchain. Um, Word. So it, it makes perfect sense. Um... And, and I've been thinking about that a lot. I mean, I, I have slight reservations because I don't like what it would, you know, what it would mean. And also, I don't know how you'd get, a, get, the, get around the zygote um, identical twins problem. I don't know what you would do about identical twins. But yes, well, in theory. they're working on the blockchain, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. The, Winkle, the Winklebot <laughs> could raid each other's Oh, world. my God, yeah. Good point. So, that. wait a minute. You're saying we're using our DNA as a sort of private key? In you would, some sort yeah. of a, a blockchain technology, a so unique, like a unique you Bitcoin wallet for every human. Everyone gets an why account. why wouldn't you be able to access my account by like cutting off my thumb? I suppose I could. I'd need your thumb. No, this this is one of the concerns. Yeah, it is one of the concerns. You'd have to add it uh, along with two factor or something you know and something you have as well, not just something you are. It sounds like if I had your thumb and maybe some of your breath. And then, like a touch, well, maybe, maybe your eye, like a variety of parts. That would be one, one factor authentication. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah. So you would have multi-factor, but also more interestingly, there's also research into brain waves and stuff as well. So apparently, your brain waves are are unique to you as well, and that cannot be easily surrendered because if you're under duress, they would no longer be. Um, you know, a signature to, to you, you'd be able to identify somebody that was under duress. So, yeah, yeah, I, do say, want I, think there's, uh, I think there's an application for using a physical sort of key along with a key of the mind as well. As, as, um, if there was a mental out. key that actually identified duress, I would be all over that. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Well, then you could just scan someone. You could be scanning someone at all times and see if they're under ever under duress. Like, we well, just... yeah. 
Yes, well, I, I definitely see this as being the long game. I definitely see, like, if you have ever read um, Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, like, he'd be loving this, you know, because this is this whole idea that actually maybe Bitcoin was created because our genes made us do it, right? Maybe all <laughs> oh. these centuries, all these millions of years of evolution has just been slowly, slowly, the genes have, like, been steering us towards the Bitcoin invention. And, and if think about it, right, like maybe this is it, maybe technology has been using us all along and we never were in control of our desires. Maybe capitalism wasn't a choice and actually it was our desires pushing us more and more into like creating this technology. Well, I and think that's plausible. Do you remember in Tron, there were the natives of the Tron universe that were not created by the users. They were just sort of spontaneously emerging from the black in the program. I, I totally think that it's plausible that Bitcoin or Satoshi Nakamoto is some sort of artificial intelligence on the internet that just emerged. I think it's a great idea that we're not going to spread our DNA to other planets, but we're going to spread the blockchain. So, you know, Mars is blockchain ready, Jupiter, Venus, you know, well, blockchain. That, but that, that's the beauty of this, though. Your DNA would be hashed along with your private key. So, so sorry, your private key would contain a hash of your. DNA, so it would be mathematically merkled into that. Um, so it would only be. So I, I do see this as a way of DNA, like gen, the genes propagating themselves and giving themselves this kind of permanence in the physics of the universe. I, I mean, I think we're all going to be wearing cuffs on our arms that are Bitcoin wallets that would also let us know if a potential partner was a good DNA match. I think if oh. once you have the DNA information, you're going to start comparing it right there, and the thing could beep if you're in range. I don't know. Derek J, you going to be wearing a cuff anytime soon? Stand I'm absolutely I charge forward towards transhumanism. I can't wait to merge with machine. This sounds like a, a wonderful uh, representation of that. I'm for it all the way. Christoph, Atlas, are there uh, civil liberty concerns if uh, my DNA now is just, necessary to buy <laughs> Oh, there's civil liberty. They're brilliant. Go on. <laughs> just some small... Um, yeah. just I, don't, I don't really see DNA being part of the private key. Where leave, we leave. If you know anything about forensics, you know that you leave DNA all over the place wherever you go, um, unless you're going to somehow remove all the skin from your body and hair and all the other stuff, too. Uh, I, I don't think it's a particularly good device for, um, you know, to, 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 to secure your bitcoins. But see, if we all lived in pods like in the Matrix, then there wouldn't be a risk of DNA contamination. And I'm told people are evolving to become hairless. <laughs> Megan Lawrence, are you going to be adopting the new DNA wallet <laughs> system? Um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical towards this uh, for the same reasons Kristoff said. Basically, it's very easy to steal other people's DNA. Um, but it's something I'm curious about. It's definitely a uh, very ambitious idea, so it's I need to look more into it. Will Pangman. Yeah, I like, I like combining that with the key of the mind, you know, the key of the soul or mind, whatever, you know, depending on how Greek you want to get. But it's, uh, you know, the important thing is you, like, to know if someone's under duress when they're submitting their physical DNA key and then have to submit their, um, the key of the mind, as I'm calling it, I guess, uh, you have to have an environment where there's an option to not give consent. So, like, that's totally foreign to what we experience in any Western government or, you know, large state government, right? There's no um, way to give consent to be governed because there's no way to not give consent. So there's, you know, you, you have to have the option to not give consent. So that might be, there might be some algorithmic um, process for uh, defining what uh, what it is to be under duress and, and the ability to then submit voluntarily uh, your consent or, you know, the key of the mind in that sense. I definitely look forward to a future where everyone's meditating and clearing their minds so they can get the ATM machine to work. There's a whole line of people. They can't quite get safe enough. They have to work on it a little more. There was a little device that, that came out in the, the news. They said they were working on uh, the, you know, the strap where it would, it would look at your 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 blood pressure or something like that. And my first thought about that was like, okay, well, as soon as it's, 
it, you know, the first time that it's it's not working quite right, then your blood pressure starts to rise. It's working even worse, and you just never get access to your Bitcoin. So I don't know. I think these technologies need to be uh, worked out on the, the the drawing board a bit more. Yeah, that's great. what I was concerned about too. Is like, what if you have like really bad social anxiety or something, and like you just <laughs> or any of those <laughs> things could be like manipulated. Yeah. What if I could inject you with something that like limited your access to your own funds because I activated your own adrenaline or I activated your own yeah. Whatever the stress hormone is, uh, you know, I mean, the the bank could do that to you. They could spray you with a mist. You can't withdraw any more money for the next. We're freezing months. your account. <laughs> freezing your account. <laughs> or, you know, some uh, some Colombian drug lords might dose you with scopolamine or something, and you're done. You you're just gonna be broke. Or worse, what if you live paycheck to paycheck and you just have anxiety about money? Well, and so that means, like, the moment you're like, oh, God, do I pay the electric bill or the rent? It says, oh, neither. Neither. I see, I, I see also a lot of repulsion towards money from, let's say, you know, the extreme left or something where they don't want to even in, embrace Bitcoin whatsoever because it just includes this feature of moneyness about it, right? So they would be totally averse, and, and that may, may not work for some folks of that ideology. I think the blood pressure cuffs are a great idea. If we could crowdsource that information, you could tell who was having stress in a certain area, avoid that area. There's a lot of good data there. We'll have to see how it goes, but we're moving on to predictions, story of the week, or final thoughts. When you share with us your story of the week that we didn't cover, or a prediction, or a final thought, are you ready? Davi Barker. Yeah, I guess my final thought... I guess I just want to announce this. You can kind of see it behind me. I've got the T-shirt over here, and you can see them all organized over here. And what that is is the Bitcoin Not Bombs uh, 2014 Hoodie the Homeless Fundraiser is launched. So you can order these T-shirts now. Uh, they're, in, they're at shinybadges.com behind the causes page, and very shortly they'll be up at bitcoinnotbombs.com. And uh, I just want to announce that. Excellent. Get your T-shirt today. Chris J. Well, actually, I just realized I won't be able to go to the Dogecoin uh, meetup uh, next week because I'll be at the Feathercoin one-year birthday meetup at the Oxford Blue in Oxford. So maybe we can do like a live link-up between uh, our event and the Dogecoin event and the World Crypto Network. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. That'd be very cool. Um, Sounds good. So that, that's on Saturday. So if you want to uh, come join us, you'll be very welcome. Every meetup we've done, we've had more people than we'd had the time before. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, we're already a year old, by the way. And also, if you haven't already, you need to update your Feathercoin wallet. Just go to feathercoin.com because we've got a hard fork coming up on Wednesday afternoon, I think, GMT. So you need to have updated. You don't have to have updated. I mean, it's not a problem. You're not going to lose your feather coins. It just means you won't be able to spend any feather coins until you've updated. And that will see faster block times and some other uh, bug features and improvements. You can go to forum.feathercoin.com to find out more. Final thought, what I would say, because this sort of came to me as we were talking about the Dogecoin thing, is it's not really the money we want. The real story about these uh, blockchains is the communities that they support. And that's the story that we're not telling. I don't think it's the money we want. I think it's each other. Derek J. Final thought, gas stations should accept Bitcoin. That's what I'm saying. Christoph Atlas. Um, I heard on Twitter earlier that uh, the dark coin, um, altcoin, they just launched, fully launched their dark send technology that's uh, now in beta and being widely used for all of the dark coin users, so I'm very interested in taking a closer look at that. Very good. Megan Lords. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, so this week, Sean's outpost went to uh, went to an evidentiary me hearing with Escambia County, and Escambia County decided to drop some of the charges uh, in, in regards to Satoshi Forest. And we're still waiting to hear the magistrate's ruling, but she did talk about dismissing. Uh, the entire thing. So we're hoping to move forward with Satoshi Forest and this is good news because it's been very stressful and we've been very worried because the county has a very long history of trying to stop people from doing good things. So we were a bit nervous about this but this is very good news and hopefully it will uh, allow us to make some really good progress uh, with Satoshi Forest. And also I will be interviewing Michael Malice, the author of Dear Reader, the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il on Wednesday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we'll be doing a Google Hangout. Uh, Michael's really interesting. It's a really interesting book. He's taking Bitcoin for his book. 
Uh, we're going to be talking about North Korea, and it's kind of kind of comes from uh, kind of North Korean propaganda almost. So we're going to be talking about that and philosophy and some stuff like that. So definitely check that out. I think it'll be really uh, it'll it'll be a different discussion. It's not going to be totally centered on Bitcoin, but I think it'll be very interesting to uh, people who are interested in foreign policy and stuff like that. Will Pangman. Uh, two things, I guess real quick, um, Monday, April 28th, um, Jeffrey Tucker will be in Milwaukee and we will be live streaming his appearance at the Milwaukee Bitcoin Meetup on Monday, April 28th. So make sure you keep, you know, put that on your calendar and tune into that. That'll be lots of fun. He's a very colorful and wonderful speaker, um, Bitcoin magnate and CEO of Liberty.me, which is exciting if you have early access to that. Uh, hopefully share your experiences with people so that they can see the kind of um, platform that that will be for, for people to use for publishing. And then I probably, um, you know, I was at the Toronto Bitcoin Expo last weekend and it was a fantastic time. Uh, you know, just very community oriented conference, really wonderful slate of speakers and just a, a great all around time. But I did um, come back with one major concern. And it's something that some of us may have heard Andreas talk about too, and some women in the space as well. Uh, there is perhaps a problem afoot with uh, the way that women are treated in the space. We've seen some bloggers blog about this, and, and um, I want to call attention and I guess a call to action really for the men in the space. Any meetups out there, community organizations, even regional or national or global Bitcoin type associations. Please take notice, especially the men. Uh, if, if there's any mistreatment, disrespect, chauvinism, misogynism, misogyny, or even sexual harassment, which is happening at a lot of these conferences to women who attend, and then elect not to attend future events or even participate in the space anymore um, because of some of this treatment, uh, obviously, you know, it, it goes without saying the kind of problem that is, whether you're concerned about. Um, mass adoption or just you know equitable treatment of people whatever um, just mutual respect whatever but um, I think the only way we can really combat this is for the men in the space to stand up when you see this going on in your meetups or in other interactions or in your companies or anywhere there are um, women entering these communities uh, entering these groups with interest uh, and then being repelled or repulsed by the treatment they receive, um, to stand up and put a stop to the other men doing this. You know, if this is something that you can tell is going is wrong and it's happening in your midst, uh, find find a fair and reasonable way to express your displeasure with the way that went between uh, you know some male and female interaction that you may have observed. The only way I see this really being stopped is if the men in the space stand up and put a stop to it, uh, hopefully hopefully, kindly and firmly, um, because we're losing, I think, some really great female minds uh, to, to the treatment. I heard from too many women in Toronto about this, this thing. It sounds epidemic, even, from some of the other conferences. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what I'd like to say. You know, if you want to put us, if you see this happening, put a stop to it so that we can make sure that we can achieve critical mass, uh, mass adoption, and, and we need these. We need women. We need women leaders, we, and, and we need uh, to be inclusive of them and not talk them down, correct them, or even be disrespectful or chauvinistic toward them. This is, you know, this is happening, and and we need to stop it. It's an excellent point, Will, and everyone should feel com comfortable at Bitcoin meetups. That's not acceptable behavior. So, moving on, prediction. Gas stations will accept Bitcoin. It makes too much sense. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Gas stations may be selling the fuel that's burning the world, but they're also no big fan of credit card companies and are paying outrageous fees. Gas stations will accept Bitcoin. Gas stations will accept Bitcoin. It will shock you when it happens, but it'll be a large chain sooner than you think and all at once. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.